Good evening and welcome everyone to an unusual dark and stormy fall equinox evening at RASC Toronto Centre. We are online and I am Dr. Elena Hyde, the second vice president of RASC Toronto Centre. This is our September Speakers Night presentation. We are super happy to be back. And just as a reminder, in case it's been so long since our last uh, talk, this is one of two types of gatherings that we have online these days, not at the Ontario Science Centre due to the pandemic, um, but online with you on YouTube. Our president, Tom Luton, will be talking about various programs later on this evening. But first, we have a very special event tonight to kick off. So I'm very excited here for our speakers night to welcome Dr. Leo Yvonne Alcorn from the University of Toronto. And I believe the acronym is D-A-D-D-A-A. -A -A. Um, it might be something exponentially longer than that, but it's the Dunlap Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, as well as at York University. So just a little bit of introduction for our fantastic speaker tonight. Dr. Alcorn is a postdoctoral researcher at in astronomy at, as I said, York University and, of course, University of Toronto. She received her PhD from Texas A&M University in 2019, and her research focuses on, well, um, some very, very mysterious objects of properties of galaxies and galaxy clusters, how dense environment in, environments in the universe affect and how galaxies form and develop. Really fun stuff. And not to mention, in her free time, she also likes to study, oh, shall I say, forbidden knowledge beyond the understanding of our uh, human minds. So that is to say, a little bit of horror stories and science fiction. Um, and some of those stories that she actually writes herself are based on current astronomical research. So if you'd like to find out more about her, um, she is on Twitter, so you can find her at uh, lylcorn underscore astro and she's also got a lovely github account which has some code so i need to go and update mine here <laughs> shortly but you can find her on github as well as lylcorn so very exciting and it's great to have her on here in toronto we can't actually see the stars tonight due to the clouds and this darkness of, of clouds blocking our view we we think we understand but maybe we don't know as much as we thought the mysteries of space expand at relativistic speeds so if we're going to try to untangle some sci-fi and science mysteries it's really lucky we have our current speaker so without any further ado dr alcorn please tell us how it's done all right thank you so much for having me it's so nice to be here. Uh, I'm excited to be talking to everybody about a subject that is really important to me, that combination of horror and astronomy. This isn't related to my normal research, so um, that, that's why I was very happy to see somebody wanted to hear about it. Um, so uh, I'm thrilled that people are interested in this subject since the, the work of Lovecraft and other kinds of cosmic horror have been present throughout my astronomical career. And they sort of gave me like a literary framework to understand my studies and my research. So anyway, I'm gonna to talk to you about two of my favorite subjects, astronomy and the fear of the unknown or horror. Um, <laughs> the universe, uh, reality, how reality works, they can be overwhelming subjects. And I found my feelings and experiences around it were very well represented by this literary genre, uh, which combines both horror and science fiction and uh, discussed phenomena and implications that I was studying uh, at that very time. And I think it changed me as a scientist and a person. And I really wanted to share with you why I think this is so important and what we can learn from this genre in particular, having to do with the history of science, uh, philosophy of science, and the scientific phenomena that Lovecraft actually represented in his work. So before I begin, I want to comment on some of the content of these books. Um, there's a bit of an elephant in the room regarding this literary genre. The creator of Lovecraftian or cosmic horror, H.P. Lovecraft, was a very racist man. I found this out when I was reading this really fun story called Rats in the Walls, which, used, which is super scary and fun until Lovecraft uses a racial slur. Ah, oh, Howie, why'd you have to ruin a perfectly good story? Anyway, some people say we have to judge people by the time in which they live, but I think that's baloney, particularly in the case of our subject, Howard Phillips Lovecraft. He was a racist, even by the standards of the time. He should not be admired or lionized due to this. Um, in fact, you should make fun of him for being a racist. Um, his work was important in the history of science fiction, popular science, and horror. 
but many of his works are tainted by his white Anglo-Saxon supremacist ideas. So if you read his books, be careful to read them with a critical eye. I'm not a scholar of race or literature, but there is quite a renaissance of cosmic horror that's related to the uh, concept of race that's happening right now. And I encourage you to read and learn as much about this as you can. I'm only not going to discuss it in this talk because I don't think I'm qualified. I'm an astronomer, not a scholar of racism or in literature. But one person I know of who's very qualified uh, and is a writer is the professor uh, Victor Laval. Uh, if you want to delve into the subject, I recommend you look up his work. Uh, in particular, I recently listened to an interview with him in the uh, podcast Imaginary Worlds, where he fantastically talks about the relationship between the Black experience in America and cosmic horror and the current media that's being made by writers and creators of color in the genre. Please look it up. It's actually very good. Um, also, I want to mention, um, I'm going to spoil a lot of plots from these stories in this talk, but these stories are written in the 1920s and 30s, so I like to think I can give you spoilers. Also, cosmic horror pretty much changed the face of horror and science fiction, so you likely know a lot of these plot points already, even if you haven't uh, followed uh, Lovecraft in particular. Also, sorry for my cute little Cthulhu here at the bottom. Uh, I had to. I even have a stuffed Cthulhu at home for my best friend. Uh, you really shouldn't take yourself too seriously uh, in this genre. Otherwise, the madness will get to you. So now that my disclaimers are out of the way, this is a talk about literature, history, and science. I'll, stalk, I'll start by talking about uh, why, uh, why we as scientists and science enthusiasts should care about science fiction, given its close relationship with science. Then I'll move on to a bit of history, both our, How, uh, both our writer How, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft, and the tumultuous times that, uh, in, that in physics that influenced his writing, as well as defining what I really mean by Lovecraftian or cosmic horror, what defines it, what influenced it. Uh, then I'll talk about three of my favorite pieces of Lovecraftian uh, literature and the science that we see in, um, in, their, um, in their plots. I'll start with The Color Out of Space, which uh, really struck me the first time I read it as being very obviously influenced by the physics of the very small and the very random quantum mechanics. Uh, then I'll talk about The Whisperer in Darkness, a tale of aliens and attempted space travel, as well as, as, well as a reflection of the massive changes in our understanding of both the solar system and what the universe actually is structured like. I'll end my examples section by talking about my favorite Lovecraft uh, story of the genre, Dreams in the Witch House, which uses uh, as a plot element the geometry of space-time, which led to the development of general relativity and was written while general relativity was, be was being developed. I'll also talk about some other uh, stories in the, that any science fan uh, who's interested in this subject should uh, read and briefly why. At the end of the talk, though, I want to give you a taste of the madness that astronomy has given me. I took something away from these stories, maybe a little bit differently than Lovecraft intended, because I want, and I want to express this to you, because it's been difficult to put these feelings into words. Um, and the best way I can think about it is by referring to astronomy and space. Hopefully you'll indulge my little mad science experiment here. Uh, I'll end with some recommended reading and films that I feel really capture the, uh, the essence of this genre uh, that uh, if you're interested in the subject, you may want to read or watch. Uh, you might already be familiar with some of them. Anyway, without further ado, um, the whole of science fiction, as we know, it really starts with Mary Shelley, who wrote the first true science fiction novel inspired by a lecture that she attended. Um, she had gone to a lecture where a professor had uh, sent an electric th current through a cadaver and it moved. Now, she got the idea to write Frankenstein from this. So not only was she using science as a plot element, um, if I've recently read Frankenstein, um, and she really delves into the implications of this new science. It, I think it can be a little alarmist at times, but it's still fun. And um, anyway, so by looking at this story, we can also learn a lot about Mary Shelley herself, the science that she was exposed to and the culture that she was in. So this continued. Um, I got the idea of this talk by, uh, because of a podcast that I listened to called The Horror Vanguard, which does analyses of horror media from a political lens. And it made me really wanna look at the science fiction and horror that shaped me and uh, is related to the science that I love so much and how it shaped our culture because this, this was all written in a very, uh, in a very important time in physics. 
anyway, so back to science fiction. Science fiction evolves with science. It helps us integrate new scientific ideas. Um, it shapes our worldview. I've included a few examples of what I think are very prominent um, uh, science fictions that affected the modern world. Um, I am a particular fan of Ursula Le Guin. Um, she wrote in the beginning of her book, The Left Hand of Darkness, um, I am not prescribing, I am describing in this novel. Um, and I like that, I like that a lot. Um, so she, she says that science fiction is less a prediction of the future and more a, uh, an exaggeration of the current time that we're in or that she was in and uh, tells us about how people are taking in this science. So I, I think it's worth exploring. So science fiction in the early 20th century, uh, beginning, uh, this, is, this is where Lovecraft came up. These were, uh, this was the time of pulp novels or pulp fiction. Um, so these are some examples of pulp magazines that, um, that Lovecraft published in. Um, at the time they were considered a little trashy, but um, I mean, people still read them. And a lot of people read them because um, it really affected modern media in particular. Um, and they were pretty good stories. Um, some pulp fiction characters you would probably recognize include Zorro, include Tarzan. Um, the detective um, uh, genre came up in pulp uh, in pulp fiction novels. Um, they started waning in influence when paperback novels became a thing. Originally, they were called pulp magazines because they were written on cheap wood pulp. Uh, but when paperback novels became a little bit more accessible and cheaper to make, uh, they, uh, paperback novels started to dominate rather than these uh, short stories that were published in magazines. So with that background, um, let's talk about the man himself, Howard Phillips, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, Howie P, H.P. Lovecraft, Lovecraft, however you refer to him. So he was born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1890. Um, he was from a formerly wealthy family that had come on really hard times. Uh, so he didn't have a lot of money, um, but uh, he started writing when he was around 17. Uh, yeah, he started, uh, I think he published his first uh, short story in one of those pulp novels when he was 17. Um, he was not very popular at the time. He, uh, uh, all he did was write in these, in these pulp novels, but he talked to a lot of other writers of these pulp novels, uh, and he collaborated with them quite heavily. Um, some very, uh, some very, um, uh, popular ones that you might know of include Robert Block, who, uh, wrote the, uh, who wrote the book that Psycho was based on, uh, August Derleth, who opened, uh, the Arkham Publishing House. He was the one who actually popularized Lovecraft after his death. Uh, and Robert E. Howard, if you like Conan the Barbarian, uh, he, he came up with Conan the Barbarian. Um, so also what made Lovecraft so influential for the time was that uh, he died without heirs in 1937. Uh, all of his solo, solo works are public domain. So people have taken these stories and run with them, expanded them. They've, uh, they've created a whole, um, uh, they, they've, because, because of the public domain aspect of it, people could use it uh, in, their, in their stories, they could use it in their movies, uh, there have been games made off of it. Um, so it, it left a lot of creative freedom. So that's part of why he became so popular uh, compared to a lot of other authors who uh, did retain uh, their, uh, their, their works, their copyrights. So we know that Lovecraft was influenced by the science of the day because he was absolutely following the scientific literature ever since he was a kid. He was a science fanboy, in particular astronomy. Um, the, it, uh, he uh, had even published uh, astronom uh, literature and amateur astronomy publications. So here I actually have a picture of uh, a uh, of his old notebook that uh, uh, that I found uh, online. So it includes uh, some of his drawings about of a comet he saw, some of his observations of other transient phenomena. Um, so, uh, but he, he said he wanted to be an astronomer, but as you can see here from a private correspondence, uh, he loved it, but uh, he was bad at math. Huh? 
anyway, so uh, the, the math really is the bugbear, he says. I originally, when I got into astronomy, thought that I wouldn't have been good enough at the math for it. Just so you know, if you or somebody else wants to become an astronomer and says, I'm too bad at math, you just have to put your head down, suffer through it. Anybody can do the math if you work hard enough at it. Uh, but uh, I guess Lovecraft didn't know that. So at this time, physics was really changing from what it used to be. This was a really important time in physics that uh, has ripples throughout modern physics. So this is a time when in particular, general relativity and quantum mechanics were being developed. So here I show a picture of some of the most prominent physicists of the time, Einstein, Max Planck, uh, and a bunch of uh, the, uh, a bunch of the physicists uh, at the uh, 1927 Solvay conference in Brussels where they were talking about uh, the uh, unsolved problems in physics of the day. Um, so this, that being said, uh, this is all very exciting and this is science that we've all been exposed to, but keep in mind for people in the early 20th century, this was all very radical changes to an understanding of how the universe works. Like for example, I show here an example of um, uh, the, what made general relativity so special time became enmeshed in space. They, be, they all became dimensions. And uh, this was, and it, it had implications that Einstein was able to predict and later prove uh, that perhaps would, could be a little disturbing to people because it uh, sort of turned the concept of simultaneity and, uh, 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 and flat space time on its head. Um, so it, it had an enormous effect on how people understood the universe as a whole. Additionally, uh, the physics of the very small was being, explore, was being explored. This is the very stuff that makes up matter, and it was being understood in very new ways. Um, quantum mechanics was being developed at this time. Um, there, so, like, the quantum mechanics just goes so against how the human brain seems to work, because we, we, we seem to perceive a very deterministic universe at the scale that we're at. However, quantum mechanics predicts a probabilistic universe. How does that even work? People ask me, oh, there must be uh, some, um, I've, I've heard people say, there must be some uh, something that's determining uh, the, uh, the positions of things um, in a, a quantum mechanical context that we just aren't able to measure. And that's not the case. That's not the case. It's all probabilistic. Anyway, so, no, I'll get more into the implications of these in a little bit, but first I want to talk about how these are related to the cosmic horror genre and why I as a scientist became so interested in the subject. So let's, let's hear from Howie P himself or a, um, uh, an impersonator. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little. But someday the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. So what I, what I uh, get from this so this is the opening lines of the famous story, Call of Cthulhu, which I'll talk about a little bit later. I'm gonna be honest with y'all. I didn't wanna talk about Call of Cthulhu because I feel like it's a little bit of a letdown as a story, but I like this quote because it really, I feel like it, uh, it, 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 it talks about a suspicion of this new science. Um, it, uh, it was um, because, because of these new, very disorienting changes in the scientific paradigm. Um, it, 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 let's see, um, I, I'm not exactly sure how to say that, but I feel like Lovecraft says it the best, that we don't really know what we're, where, we're, where we're going. We don't know what we're gonna find. 
And if the universe isn't deterministic and if simultaneity is a little bit blurrier than what we thought, do we really even know anything about the universe? Um, so I, even though I take a little bit of a different um, bottom line from this um, than Lovecraft did, I still think it, it's uh, very telling about how this subject uh, was taken in a literary uh, in a literary framework. So now that we've talked about Howie and uh, how how he wanted to write about uh, science in his horror, let's talk about what Lovecraftian horror actually is. So here I've included some ideas of uh, what uh, the uh, what the literary genre really tells us. So. The, basically, the monster in Lovecraft's in Lovecraftian stories is not Cthulhu. It's not Azathoth. It's not these alien gods. It's the universe as a whole. And he uses these concepts uh, that we assume every day in astronomy um, and, and sees them as something horrifying. So, for example, um, he talks about uh, basically he's taking the naturalistic universe and making it terrifying that there's phenomenon that we as humans are not prepared to understand because the universe is more complex than our brains would allow. Um, but it's all naturalistic. Even the gods are just aliens who understand a bit more about the universe than we do. So there's the, the universe is horrifying to him. And what's more, humanity is very, very small in, uh, in Lovecraftian literature. Humans are considered unimportant and significant uh, compared to the scale of the cosmos as a whole. In addition, I guess I could, I sort of related to this, to these stories because a lot of the uh, protagonists of his stories are, um, are actually academics like myself or they're scholars of some sort. And they're so focused on understanding what's going on, sort of, I guess, like myself, um, that they don't actually see what's going on and they become a little bit brittle to what they see. They uh, expect to see a universe that, in a certain way, but they see something that their brains don't understand and they're vulnerable to it and they go insane or they die. Uh, so very happy endings there. Uh, but I, as a scientist, am hoping to take it maybe in a little bit of a different direction uh, in my own Lovecraftian horror story. Uh, so I've defined Lovecraftian horror for you now. Let's get into the meat of the lecture, where I start talking about some of my favorite stories. So let's talk about The Color Out of Space, uh, the, uh, the sort of title story. I, this was one, so this story I recommend people read because it's, it's not very long and also a movie recently came out um, that Nick Cage starred in and uh, it was like a, it was like a contemporary version of this story. So if you don't actually want to read it, uh, watch it because they really know how to use Nick Cage in that, in that movie and it made me so happy. It's Nick Cage at his A game. Also, it's, this is apparently Nick Cage's favorite uh, Lovecraft story, which gives me a whole new respect for this man. Uh, so anyway. I'm gonna give you a little plot summary. Sorry about spoilers, but uh, what, what happens is, and uh, I have a picture from the original um, publishing, uh, uh, what an asteroid uh, hits some farmland, uh, everything around it starts dying, um, and uh, eventually everybody dies or goes insane. There we go, end. Um, but what, what struck me while I was reading it, and keep in mind, I was reading this while I was learning about quantum mechanics, um, all, he, he talks about um, some processes that scientists at the time would have used to study this. Uh, in particular, the optical properties, spectra. I was learning about that at the time and it made me happy to learn about. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about these subjects then. So prominently what people point out when they look, when they um, talk about the color out of space is they talk about how um, the color appears to have effects similar to radiation. Um, so radiation was uh, was being discovered at around this time. Um, let's see. Uh, I only briefly want to go into it uh, because there's been a lot written about this. But um, at this time, um, radium and radiative uh, things seemed totally cool because, like, they glowed in the dark and they had a lot of medical applications. But um, it also had this dark side that people learned because many of the uh, researchers who studied it, like for example here, uh, 
uh, Henry uh, Becquerel and uh, Marie Curie uh, and her uh, and her husband and assistant Perry Curie, uh, Pierre Curie, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, died from uh, cause. Well, per Pierre didn't die from radiation related causes, but Mary did. Um, so th they they died from illnesses very clearly related to their exposure from radiation because they it wasn't that they were stupid they just didn't know um so like marie mary curie um was known to like carry around all these samples in her pocket or or like handle them with her bare hands but again she didn't know um so when people learned about this and uh like uh radium was uh was being used to uh paint things and uh, there were girls who would lick paint brushes and um paint using radiative paint uh it caused a lot of health problems so despite it being really cool science really proved to be a double-edged sword in this case. So radiation was uh, is one of the prominent things people talk about uh, because everything slowly sickens and dies like radiation poisoning. But I want to talk a little bit more about quantum mechanics and spectroscopy since Lovecraft brought it up. So I, I, can, I feel like I can uh, riff off of that. So with that quote I gave you uh, earlier, I was absolutely tickled when Lovecraft talked about how scientists at Miskatonic University, the university he always talks about in his stories, were studying the asteroid uh, that um, uh, had that brought in the color for, uh, from outer space. As as mentioned, they measured a spectrum to try to learn what material this object was made of, and they didn't find anything at all useful. Um, so, what they were trying to find was at um, one of the consequences of quantum mechanics is that uh, energy is delivered in these little quantized packets, and how the, the um, uh, it the these little quantized packets uh, so, uh, are photons, and they have very specific wavelength ranges or very specific colors that they'll emit depending upon what element they uh, they are emitted from. So additionally. We, uh, this is all. This was actually able to be. Uh, they were actually able to determine this uh, by looking at um, uh, the model of the atom. Really changed at that time period. On the left, you see the Bohr model of the atom. So this is hydrogen in the uh, previous version of what they thought atoms looked like. Um, so there's an electron and there's a proton, and the electron orbits the proton. It seems like kind of beautiful and fractal, very similar to the rest of the universe. But uh, they found out that that's not the case. Instead, um, electrons exist. Electrons exist in this cloud of probability. So on the right, you can see um, all these clouds of probability, depending upon the energy of the uh, of the um, uh, uh, electron that we're dealing with. Um, and they have these beautiful patterns, actually. But the electron itself does not actually exist in one place. It, it's it's probabilistic. You can't actually pick out one space that it's in. So this this is, is a bit of I guess a disorienting concept because how can matter not exist in a place? It exists as a probability density function. That's how what we refer to it as in quantum mechanics courses. So it, it's 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 an unnerving concept to think that we're made of something that is not actually as solid as we think so i just wanted to talk about that and uh riff on and go into how we use this in astronomy so as an example i wanted to talk about the hydrogen spectrum because one it's the easiest to calculate when you're in a quantum mechanics course and two we use it all the time in astronomy so um here here's an example of what lovecraft scientists were trying to do um so what we have here on the right is uh a image of um how uh, light can be divided using a prism or a grating, and you can take it apart into its component parts. If we're looking at a continuous spectrum, say from like the sun, uh, you see a rainbow pattern. It's so that rainbow pattern that uh, that you see when you take a prism, put it up to the light. So elements and molecules though, will emit or absorb specific um, wavelengths of this light. As you can see on the right, sodium, hydrogen, calcium, mercury, they all emit at specific wavelengths. And we as astronomers, if we want to say, measure how much of, a, uh, of an element is in a star or a galaxy, we look for these lines. Um, they have very specific patterns. Um, and if they're a little bit offset, then, they, then we can say that they're redshifted. More about that in our next story. So let's talk about 
hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, so we use it in astronomy a lot. So um, here, uh, up at the top, I put in um, the uh, hydrogen Balmer lines. So the hydrogen Balmer lines are actually <laughs> a uh, atomic transition I use nearly every day of my life now as an astronomer. Um, what happens is the electron in a hydrogen atom moves from an energy state to the second energy state. Uh, this is not all that important, but it creates these beautiful lines. In particular, I want you to look at the red line at the top. That's what we call hydrogen alpha. That color is a true color when it is emitted on Earth. Um, it's a nice red. It's at, uh, if you uh, if you know, um, like the wavelengths of light, it's uh, located at 6563 angstroms. And what's interesting about this astronomically is that we often use it as a way of measuring star formation. So say um, uh, bottom right panel, um, you, uh, you see a star and uh, so typo stars are super, these are super big, uh, very brightly burning stars. They're so, they burn so brightly, they're blue. Um, so they emit a continuous spectrum, but these, these, these um, stars don't live very long. So for most of their lives are actually surrounded by their birth clouds. Um, and these birth clouds are made of hydrogen because it's the most common element in the universe. So it absorbs the, this light at very specific wavelengths, as you can see uh, in the um, emission line spectrum at the bottom of that image. And I can actually use that hydrogen alpha line uh, to get an estimate for how, how many of those bright stars are in a galaxy and therefore how fast a galaxy is forming stars. So I think that that's super cool. That's some science that Lovecraft mentioned. Um, moving on to our next story, because I would like to talk to y'all a little bit more about redshift in a little bit. So another story, Whisperer in Darkness. Uh, this, this, one, um, this one is a bit more narrative than the color out of space. Um, it was a very fun tale and a bit more horror-y in my opinion. So what happens? Plot summary, um, uh, and you're going to get a major spoiler at the end. Um, the, uh, a professor at Miskatonic uh, gets some letters from a very uh, from gets some very 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 weird letters from a guy who's saying you need to stop saying saying aliens aren't real. They're attacking me and my dogs. Um, until eventually, he sends a letter that says, "No, the aliens are peaceful. You should come and say hi." Uh, so that's a little creepy. Um, so he comes by because um, the uh, the characters in uh, in Lovecraft novels can be a little bit airheaded, and I see myself becoming one the closer I get to becoming a professor. Anyway, um, so he visits, he talks to uh, this guy. His name is Ackley. He seems he seems like he's not feeling too good, um, but uh, he. He meets the aliens. Uh, he says the aliens are peaceful. They just want to show humans the cosmos. They want to take them to their home planet, Ugoth. Um, problem is humans have a hard time moving through space, so they just need to take your brain out and put it in a jar. Um, so <laughs> uh, they're trying to convince this professor to go with them. Uh, toward the end, uh, the, the professor gets a little bit weirded out because he hears the aliens chanting in the woods and um, he goes to see his friend and it turns out um, his friend um, uh, was not actually his friend. It was some aliens in a mask and a costume <laughs> trying to convince him to go with them. They already removed his friend Atlee's brain and they're, they're sending him to Yugoth, which by the way, leading into my science talk, is Pluto. So. This story was published in 1930, very, very, very shortly after Pluto was discovered. Um, so I'm going to show you some pictures. First of all, so I went to uh, the Lowell Observatory for on holiday one year. So I have some pictures here. Um, so uh, on the far left is a bust of the man who discovered Pluto. His name is Clyde Tombaugh. And I was there for the Pluto flyby with uh, New Horizons. So they were having a whole Pluto themed event for the flyby. And uh, they put him in a, uh, in a shirt, which by the way, he was only 23 when they set him to, um, uh, to discover Pluto. 
Anyway, uh, in the middle, there is an image of the observatory that he discovered Pluto on. Uh, and on the right, I didn't take this picture because I'm not a photographer and actually very terrible at taking indoor photos. Um, uh, this is the actual telescope that he observed Pluto on. And if you would like to see the actual images of Pluto, here we are. I'm not sure if y'all can see it, but the little arrow on the left and the right shows Pluto moving. And what Clyde did was he, he was switching back and forth between these photos and trying to see what was moving. And from these photos uh, dated in January 1930, uh, you can see Pluto clearly moving. Um, so that inspired Lovecraft to put Pluto in one of his stories, AKA Yugoth. Um, so yeah, he, he, he started writing that real fast after the discovery. So Pluto is sort of um, the preeminent uh, scientific concept that Lovecraft brings up in this story. But there is also another scientific concept that I want to talk to you about that he briefly mentions. This is actually the first story where Lovecraft uses the word galaxy. This was also a pretty major discovery of the time very shortly before Lovecraft started writing, where people actually for a long time didn't know that the Milky Way was not the whole of the universe. They thought the Milky Way was the universe. And in fact, all of the galaxies that we now know are outside the Milky Way, they were called spiral nebulae because they, they thought that they were just a part of the Milky Way. Um, and here's some images that were taken um, uh, of um, what people thought these spiral nebulae were because they didn't have like great images at the time. CCD technology was really a boon for astronomy. I'll tell you that. Um, you, they a lot better at absorbing photons than uh, 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 photo plates. Um, so I, I could see why they would think that these objects were inside of the Milky Way without that level of um, uh, detail. Now, that, that being said, it was a pretty reasonable assumption at the time. Um, the idea of many different galaxies, many different universes, this was called island universes, and it was actually more of a philosophical and mystical concept. As you can see, um, some, some of the people who championed it were not really scientists. Uh, they were well, like uh, Swedenborg and Kant, who, uh, I mean, they were surprisingly pretty spot on, not gonna lie. Um, but this changed, actually, uh, again, we, uh, we go back to Lowell Observatory, um, and I want to talk to you about the guy who um, was the first uh, to discover that these objects were not actually in the Milky Way. Uh, a chronically overlooked scientist is this man, Vesto Slifer. Um, he uh, worked at Lowell Observatory, and he measured the spectral lines of several galaxies, uh, in particular what he called the Andromeda Nebulae, uh, which we now know as the Andromeda Galaxy. The, biggest galaxy that's coming right for us and eventually is gonna smash into us. Uh, he discovered uh, that uh, the spectral lines that I showed you from the previous story were redshifted. That means that these galaxies are moving away from us so fast that the light itself expands apart. And when light expands apart, it looks redder because the wavelength gets longer. So uh, he, there was a very clear atomic signal uh, but it was shifted. These these things must be moving very far away from, uh, very fast away from us. In fact, so fast, it's probably not in the Milky Way. Additionally, Vesto sort of, in my opinion, hacked redshift. And he discovered that these, these galaxies were rotating. Because if you look at the spectrum of these objects, if you look at one side, one side will be slightly more redshifted than the other. One side will be moving toward us, one side will be moving away from us. As we see, one side is redshifted, that little red arrow moving away from us, one side is blue shifted, moving toward us. I have uh, on top a overhead view of the uh, Whirlpool galaxy and on the bottom sort of an edge on view, which um, is of the Sombrero galaxy. I, um, so, I mean, this is actually sort of my thesis research. Uh, so I, I, I was very interested in uh, learning about this. And when I visited the Lowell Observatory, I got to see the, um, uh, the actual spectrograph that Vesto measured this on. Uh, here we go, this is, this is it. Yeah, yeah, so I took a picture of it. Sorry for my terrible picture taking skills, but I was just thrilled to see this actual spectrograph uh, that, uh, that really changed the face of astronomy as a whole. So that actually, this actually created a, a little bit of a rift in astronomy. There was a whole, um, uh, 
debate. Uh, they called it the great debate um, about whether the universe was expanding apart or if it was um, a static universe. So um, uh, one of the people to take Vesto's work, well, I, I think he actually came up with this a little bit before Vesto, but um, there was, he came up with the idea of an expanding universe. Uh, this was a man, uh, again, unfortunately, criminally uh, overlooked, Georges Lemaitre, uh, who uh, proposed the expanding universe uh, idea in 1927 about when Lovecraft was writing. Um, this made a lot of physicists and astronomers very uncomfortable. <laughs> um, astronomers like to um, make an assumption that we on Earth in our galaxy are not special. Um, it makes the math a lot easier and there's no reason to think that we're in a special place in the universe. Um, so that being said, uh, Lemaitre's um, math was perfect, spot on, but people didn't like the idea that this universe is changing is expanding um started out at a beginning so um in particular i, I put uh, a quote here uh einstein uh einstein to lemaitre because they einstein didn't like this idea your calculations are correct but your physics is atrocious um so that being said the evidence was in george lemaitre's um um uh, favor uh when uh, Vesto and uh, when Vesto Slifer and when Edwin Hubble found all of these galaxies were expanding away from us, it, um, I mean, George Lemaitre had, uh, had predicted uh, this expansion factor that Hubble was able to actually publish. So this led to uh, something called the Great Debate, where people uh, debated the expanding universe versus uh, the solid state universe. Fred Hoyle, uh, my academic great, 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 great grandfather. So my advisors, 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 blah, blah, blah. Uh, he referred to this as the Big Bang Theory. Uh, it was meant to be an insult, but uh, I guess it's stuck. It's not actually all that insulting. All right, so that's enough about Whisper in Darkness. Let's talk about my favorite Lovecraft story, Dreams in the Witch House. Now, I'm not going to give you a full summary for this because I want you to read this story, actually. It's one of his, it's one of Lovecraft's longer stories, but um, I started reading it uh, when I was a physics student and I liked that the main character was a physics student. Anyway, so the physics student meets uh, moves into this house at Mis near Miskatonic University to study physics and folklore, and he meets a immortal witch. Now, the witch, uh, the, the thing is, the house that he lived in, this witch lived in, and the witch is not a witch. She's not magical. She's just an early physicist. She's also a terrible person who convinces the physics student to do awful things. Uh, but she, what she does is she knows how to manipulate space time. She knows how to, uh, in fact, um, uh, Lovecraft talked about how she would travel along these uh, these these odd shapes that would form in the in the student's room, uh, and how it felt wrong. Um, because um, he was referring to something in particular called non-Euclidean geometry. Um, so let's let's just really talk about what that is. Uh, non-Euclidean geometry is not as scary as you think, um, unless you're in a class where you have to use it to derive um, some Einstein equation. Um, but uh, let's let's not think too much about that because it's uh, flashbacks of. GR courses. Um, so non-Euclidean geometry is, was actually not overly new by the time Lovecraft was around. Uh, this was developed in like 1813 by Carl Gauss uh, and some other people uh, contemporaneously, um, but uh, he never actually published it. But um, non-Euclidean geometries had been thought of um, even in the time of like the Islamic golden age. Um, many, many great um, uh, mathematicians had tried, ha had tried to sort of break Euclidean geometry. So what do I mean by Euclidean geometry? These are, this is the basic geometry that we learned in high school that uh, was, uh, that was developed by Euclid. Um, he had several uh, laws about how things should work, all, uh, uh, all of the degrees of a uh, of a circle always add up to 360 degrees of a triangle always add up to 180 and um 
But it turns out if you're not working in sort of a flat dimensionality, that doesn't hold anymore. Say if you want to work in a spherical or a hyperbolic plane. Um, so eventually uh, people like uh, Gauss figured out how to do this. And then uh, Riemann, uh, there, I forget his first name, uh, started applying it to modern physics and Einstein used it to create general relativity. Um, now that being said, um, it, it, these, these things sometimes look a little bit funky. So I can see why Lovecraft decided to use it as a plot element for a, a sort of a shorthand to refer to like settings that feel wrong because for a long time, people who had worked in math thought that non-Euclidean geometry breaking the, the laws of Euclid seemed wrong. But at the same time, we, we actually measure it. And I mean, so now, now that we've talked about non-Euclidean geometry, let's talk a little bit about general relativity and some of the weirder things that it implies. So GR was developed using this, these mathematics, um, but the reality of these geometries is even stranger than what Lovecraft wrote. So here are some fantastic images I found online uh, that I feel explain some consequences of general relativity. Um, breaking it down, um, basically what GR says is that in an accelerating frame of reference or in a gravitational field, things act the same. Say, if you are in a closed room uh, with no windows, how would you be able to tell if you dropped a ball, whether you were on Earth or if you were in a spaceship accelerating up at 1G? So that would feel the same. Also, if you were freely falling, uh, you would, uh, how, how can you tell whether you're freely falling or not in a gravitational field at all? They're equivalent, that's relativity. Um, so relativity implies some interesting things. So when the fact that a gravitational field and an accelerating frame of reference can be considered equivalent, um, that means mass and gravitational fields will warp space-time. So one of the things Einstein predicted is something called gravitational lensing. And gravitational lensing, in my opinion, is so interesting that when I started out in college, I was a fermentation science major. I changed my major to physics after learning that this exists. So basically what happens is in a uh, in this curved space-time, we get these non-Euclidean geometries because what looks like a straight line might not be a straight line in uh, the frame of reference uh, that the light is traveling in. So when, um, when it, the light goes through a gravitational field, it'll bend like it would uh, if, it were in, uh, if it were an accelerating frame of reference because light has a finite speed. So Einstein predicted that this would uh, that this would happen around massive objects. Uh, in particular, there was a famous experiment involving a solar eclipse uh, that he predicted uh, would cause multiple images of stars from behind the sun, and somebody took a picture of it. It's real. We know it exists. So here's sort of a picture of how we use that now in astronomy. So uh, in particular, um, galaxy clusters are very, very, very massive uh, collections of matter in the universe. It's so massive that it can warp space time. And what we see here is uh, a galaxy behind this, uh, uh, this gravitational lens, this galaxy cluster will bend around the galaxy cluster, the lens itself, and create multiple and distorted magnified images. I like to say that this is sort of like nature's telescope um because you, you it magnifies this light and astronomers actually do use this to look at very far away objects at amazing detail and again we know it exists we have pictures in fact i even took a picture and used it to create a tattoo that i made look there's there's my uh, there's my lens there's my background galaxies that are all distorted now let's see what happens when we add a little mass to the system anyway moving on from stories and silliness Let's talk about some other stories that I think you might find very interesting. So I, I mentioned the Call of Cthulhu at the beginning. Um, the, uh, I, I think it's a little bit of a letdown of, the, of a story. A bunch of sailors say they saw uh, the ancient city of Rillie where Cthulhu sleeps. Um, and all of uh, the, the buildings have very weird geometry, hmm? non-Euclidean geometry. Um, 
I, I also include, uh, um, if you are interested in physics, uh, you might want to look up, uh, in, in uh, jokey physics, uh, you might want to look up this paper, um, which was written by uh, an, uh, a person pretending that he, uh, that he lives in the Lovecraftian universe and um, uh, trying to talk about how this would be possible uh, using real math. Um, let's see, another one, Shadow Out of Time. Um, that was a very fun one. Um, th this one, the aliens are actually really interesting. They take over a human's body so that they can study humanity and Earth. And um, turns out they've been visiting all sorts of civilizations uh, on Earth throughout time just to study, uh, just, just to learn. They're scientists. Um, so I, I think this is interesting from an astronomical standpoint because it deals with huge geological time scales that you might be interested in. And uh, let's see, then uh, there's the Mountains of Madness, um, which again talk, uh, uh, which is where, uh, let's see, uh, it, ins uh, it sort of inspired the movie, The Thing, um, but not really because um, uh, basically what a bunch of Antarctic explorers find is an ancient city that um, a civilization before hu humans lived in. Um, and uh, it deal, again, deals with large time scales. And I thought that was very interesting and everybody should read it. Uh, and uh, then uh, an early work of Lovecraft, uh, Nyarlathotep. Um, Tesla um, would have been uh, would have been sort of. I, I, there's some conjecture that uh, Lovecraft may have seen or seen uh, may have seen or ha um, read uh, newspaper articles about the shows of Nikola Tesla, and it's pretty clear that the character Nyarlathotep was based on him. Um, it's a very short story. I just thought it was very fun to read um, because uh, Nicola put on a good show and so did Nyarlathotep. And Nyarlathotep is one of my favorite of uh, the Lovecraftian gods. And if you read more, maybe you can see why. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about Lovecraft and about the science in Lovecraft, um, I, I kind of want to bear, bear my heart to you all. Um, when I've, I've been asked a few. I've been asked a few times in my life when I when people ask me, "Oh, what do you do?" Oh, I'm an astronomer, and somebody and people will ask, "How do you handle the existential dread?" <laughs> or uh, "Why do anything when we're so small and unimportant?" Um, and I actually had to spend a little bit of time thinking about that in graduate school. Um, my day to day research is I study very huge things, galaxy clusters. Um, so this this impacted me because I'm dealing with enormously huge numbers and learning these things is a very intense process. Um, I, I include one of the joke books, uh, Surviving Your Stupid, Stupid Decision to Go to Grad School. Um, it's, it's a lot of pressure. Uh, additionally, you're dealing with these huge numbers and you're sort of in a way reducing them down to something that your brain can handle, that is numbers. So sometimes it's a little bit of a trip, I think, uh, to think about all these galaxies that I study and reduce them down to a mass, a position, a rotational velocity, um, uh, just in my computer. And there's more to them than that. When I actually really think about the implications of these things, it can become a little bit overwhelming. And I want to be able to talk to people about this, but I find it hard to do unless um, you'll let me indulge my evil plan that I had talked about earlier. So I love mad scientists in literature. So I finally have my chance now to become one. So I am going to show the whole world how small we are. I want you to see the void like I see. I want you to stare into the abyss and the monstrous galaxies that I try to understand every day. Uh, but uh, don't worry. Um, uh, uh, like all mad scientists, I know what I'm doing is the right thing and will bring the world to its knees. I, I mean, give you a new perspective. So let's start out. Um, if you're um the pale blue dot in particular is something I, I i like to think about when you are a small ape on this enormous rock that is floating in that little sunbeam as uh carl sagan so wonderfully put it you are you are so small on this on this tiny little rock and i can barely even see where the earth is on this uh on this picture um so you're only i'm I'm only about 60 kilograms. 
uh, this rock is um, six times 10 to the 24 kilograms. If you are not familiar with scientific notation, that is six with 24 zeros after it. That's huge. Do you even, I mean, I can't, I don't know about you, but my brain, I mean, I can imagine 24 zeros after a six, but do you really understand it? Just how huge this is? So that being said, if you, at the end of this talk, if you find these, these subjects a little bit overwhelming, I recommend listening to the pale blue dot speech because it's pretty much what I'm trying to tell you, but in a little bit more benefic way. Um, so you're on this rock and this rock is orbiting a star. So the sun, if, if you're like me and grew up in the era of ska, you know that the sun is a middle-sized star. Thank you, uh, I forget uh, the, the, the ska band that taught me that. Um, so one solar mass is around two times 10 to the 30 kilograms, two 30 zeros afterward. That is uh, 33, uh, uh, 333,000 Earths inside of this star. Um, it makes up 99% of the mass of the solar system. Pretty much the rest of it is made up of Jupiter. Um, and again, this is a middle-sized star. Some stars can get much bigger than the sun. Um, the sun is, isn't even big enough to form a black hole when it dies. Me being the astronomer saying, oh, it's so small, it won't form a black hole. <laughs> so these stars are in, a, are in the Milky Way galaxy. This galaxy contains 100 billion of these suns, uh, stars, and these stars are so far apart. They're around four light years apart uh, on average. Um, I once did, um, I, I tried to create a scaled solar system walk once, and I did the math. And if you reduced the sun down to about three, uh, three inches in diameter, uh, and I'm holding it here in Toronto, uh, the closest star would be in Atlanta, Georgia. So just to give you an idea of how uh, far apart things are, uh, and there's many of them. Um, additionally, uh, there is a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. Um, you can see uh, on the image here, uh, there's a long exposure of our galaxy. Uh, we are looking into the disk of it because we are inside of it. The bright spot toward the center is the galactic center. And in, inside of that, all that dust, and clouds, there's, the su there's a supermassive black hole. And that is around uh, 26,000 light years away. <laughs> That's such an enormous amount of time. Uh, additionally, people have tried to measure the mass of the Milky Way by measuring orbits of things uh, in the Milky Way's halo. And they found that it's uh, equivalent to the mass of, oh boy, uh, uh, around two times 10 to the 12 suns. So remember, remember how big the sun is, remember, compared to us? That, that, that's a lot of suns. Um, and that includes uh, a measurement of dark matter, by the way, which I, I haven't even gotten into um, because we don't even know what that is. Um, so I've talked about galaxies. Let's talk about my favorite subject, the, the thing that I'm told I'm a little bit crazy for that I always think of. It, but but it is not I that is mad. It is the rest of the world that is mad. Anyway, so galaxy clusters, my favorite thing. Bet there, the galaxy clusters are defined as a gravitationally bound group of galaxies and dark matter and gas, uh, somewhere between hundreds to thousands of galaxies. Here's a picture of a galaxy cluster. They're beautiful. Um, the uh, overall masses of them tend to be around, oh God, 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 suns. Um, so that being said, most of this mass is dark matter and super hot X-ray gas. That's so hot that it rips off the gas from galaxies as it falls into uh, the gravitational potential. Um, and uh, it, uh, uh, it'll, um, uh, and so because of that, it's, it shuts off star formation. And uh, I like to joke, this is where galaxies go to die. So uh, just to uh, sort of uh, give you the total madness uh, of this, let's talk about the whole of the universe now. Only 4% of it is of any kind of matter that I've talked about. 
uh, I haven't gotten into dark matter or dark energy, uh, and that makes up most of the universe. Um, additionally, it is unknowably old, even older than Azathoth and Cthulhu themselves. Um, so yes, uh, that is the universe, and basically what I what I want to, you to take away from this is I I this can be a little overwhelming, but I. If you're a scientist, this actually just makes things more exciting. Um, it helps you. I recommend you learn to love what you don't understand. Don't don't do what Lovecraft did and fear it. Look into its eyes. Look into the eyes of of Cthulhu and the Void and ask questions about it. Don't just say, "Oh, that isn't what I expected," and go insane. So that's, I guess what I got out of this genre, even though maybe I took it in a bit of a different direction than Lovecraft did. So if you're interested in this at all, I recommend uh, any further reading. Um, some, some of the uh, creators here, uh, I feel really understood Lovecraft. Um, additionally, uh, I've included uh, some direct adaptations of Lovecraft stories or reworkings of them that uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, I still recommend that you watch The Color Out of Space with Nick Cage. It rocks. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have watched Stranger Things, know that that is pretty much a modern version of a Lovecraft tale. And uh, from there, uh, I think I'll end it. Um, let's see. Uh, are there any questions about Lovecraft, science, the unknown, the void, my madness? Well, before we get on to uh, too many of the questions, let me just say thanks again to our our speakers. So thank you, Dr. Alcarn. It's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful talk. I, I think um, I might be wrong, but the uh, the sun song you were referencing was likely they might be giants. Yes, we do that actually was have an astronomically accurate uh, solar. Um, Ballad, shall I say? <laughs> and it's been great to journey with you through the, uh, um, the the theories of the unknown, as it were. It's the contemporary relevance of Lovecraft is really um, it is still a big part of our astronomy science fiction uh, history, and it goes beyond what some might like to admit. But uh, you know, the influence is, as I say, really undeniable. And um, actually, I'll add to your list of recent sci-fi recommendations with. Uh, Lovecraft County, which has come out um, recently as a, a TV show um, set in the 1950s, uh, which sort of combines a uh, horror of the unknown plus um, a, a bit of a modern update. Um, and it's it's been great to you know have a ponder looking back into you know the vast distances of space. I really love the picture you painted of the universe as the monster, yeah. unimaginably larger than we can imagine, but we can still try to understand it. And, um, you know, I'm not sure I would personally vote to get my brain removed to travel to Pluto, Same. but I can only guess what our folks in chat might might vote for. <laughs> so um, I believe we have a few questions, one or two. Um, let's go ahead and pass over to Emma to set up for questions for our speaker now. Thank you. We do have a few questions. The first one comes in from Blake. Um, do you have a flying spaghetti monster bumper sticker? Oh, I wish. Uh, I don't actually, but uh, <laughs> I have I, I, a number of my friends in college did. Um, let's see. No, I just have my little stuffed Cthulhu. Thanks. Um, second question comes in from Lewis. Are you interested in other science fantasy novels or writers? God, uh, yes, let me think of, uh, but most of them are very Lovecraft influenced uh, if, when I think about it uh, now. But I also really like uh, Arthur Clarke. Um, I talked about how much I love Ursula Le Guin. Currently I'm reading Dune, which isn't like hard sci-fi, but um, I really wanted to read Dune again before the movie came out. Uh, so Frank Herbert, um, uh, let's see who else there there's a number that I've been meaning to read I've also been reading uh, the expanse series uh, and watching the show I really enjoyed that as a physicist because talk about using physics concepts as plot points <laughs> I've never had a gravitational slingshot be so exciting thanks um, do you think JW will have a bigger impact on our understanding of the universe than we presently believe JW um, I don't know. That's actually what was written. 
Perhaps oh, James uh, Webb Space Telescope? Oh, James, James oh. Webb Space Telescope. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about James Webb Space Telescope. I wrote a proposal for it that didn't get accepted. But, um, I mean, we're going to be able to see so deep into the universe that we're going to... So, since I study galaxy clusters, uh, this is going to be a fantastic uh, um, uh, instrument, uh, the telescope in particular, because so much of my research has been hampered by the atmosphere. Uh, I like to joke that um, if I actually was a mad scientist, I would destroy the atmosphere because um, these, um, so the sky has emission lines that um, have really messed up my work. Um, if so, it gets in the way of emission lines of galaxies that I tried to measure because the um, uh, the galaxies that I'm interested in are redshifted all the way to the infrared. They're moving that far away from us. I mean, they're moving that fast away from us. Um, and the atmosphere emits in the infrared. Um, so it, one way to get around this is to go above the atmosphere. Uh, so the atmosphere does not need to be harmed now, uh, thanks to James Webb. Uh, additionally, uh, it's going to look very deep into the universe. We're going to see Pretty much, I mean, we're already seeing the first clusters forming, but we're starting to be able to, uh, we're going to be able to see like reionization when the galaxy, when uh, the universe started becoming transparent again. Um, we're going to be able to see um, how, how protoplanets form, how protostars form. It's, it's really going to have an enormous effect on astronomy. And I'm so excited for it to get up there. December 18th, we're all watching. Wow. Um, they don't have much astronomy content, but are you also a fan of Enjoy Reanimator from Beyond, sort of with mad <laughs> scientist Herbert West? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Herbert West Reanimator. Uh, I saw a little bit of that one year. I think I fell asleep during it, but um, that, that was a fun series. I, I sometimes have a hard time uh, with um, animal deaths, uh, but um, I'd make an exception for that movie. Um, and it was a direct adaptation of a Lovecraft story. I watched um, as well a movie based on From Beyond. That wasn't very good. I, I, I should watch the 80s version. It's probably a, quite a bit better. Um, let's see, additionally, um, I forget the name of the movie, but there was pretty much, um, uh, when in terms of earlier Lovecraft adaptations, Vincent Price was involved in one. I think it was the statement of Randolph Carter. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was another one. I forget what I forget which one it was. Um, but yeah, I uh, I haven't watched From Beyond. I need to watch that. Halloween uh, October's coming up, so I, I do my month of Halloween uh, of the horror movies. I'm probably going to watch that then. Nice. Um, can we find your reading list at the Merrill Collection? Uh, at the Merrill Collection. Oh, uh, I actually haven't checked. Um, that being said, all of Lovecraft's works are online for free. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Lovecraft Country is uh, online, I believe. I've heard good things about it. I haven't seen it. Um, these actual stories, let's see. Um, uh, the Ballad of Black Tom, you can find that on Amazon. That's written by Victor Laval, who I mentioned very early on in uh, the talk. Uh, the Weird of Hali, that's on um, uh, any bookstore. Uh, she Walks in Shadows is a fantastic um, compilation of all uh, contemporary female horror writers uh, writing in Lovecraftian style. Um, so that being said, I would be surprised if you couldn't find most of these stories in uh, your local library. Cool. This is our last question for tonight, but uh, what are your thoughts on the existence of aliens? Okay, so, so, um, I, I and any astronomer will tell you it is very unlikely that there are not aliens. There's just so much space. And now the exoplanet scientists have shown us that there are so many exoplanets in habitable zones. Uh, and the biologists, the astrobiologists have shown us that life can grow in just such diverse environments. I mean, extremophiles are really Extremophiles and water bears, they're, they're really what convinced me there has to be aliens out there. Um, now, whether we've come in contact with them, I'm a little bit doubtful. Um, the wow signal, I guess, uh, is something people might want to look up, uh, but it's never been repeated. Um, and uh, also, uh, if, if, you're, if you're like me, um, 
I, I had a sleep paralysis incident when I was a child uh, that I thought for a long time was a uh, alien abduction. But uh, if, if you are um, at all, if you want to learn about this uh, subject, I recommend that you look up the sleep paralysis phenomenon. Um, but it, it did give me a lifelong fear of alien abductions uh, as well. Um, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, there has to be aliens. Whether they're like us or a visit to us, I'm, I'm a little doubtful. Cool. Um, we actually did get one more question. Did you watch Star Trek? Uh, yes, Star Trek is wonderful. Uh, TNG forever, Picard is my captain. Um, let's see, but uh, I, I like Star Trek. Uh, it's sort of the perfect example of um, how, how science fiction is a reflection of our own society. Um, because of that, I, I've heard really good things about Deep Space Nine. I haven't seen a lot of Deep Space Nine yet, but I'm, I'm told it might be particularly interesting for like people our age now. Um, but uh, I, I'm st I, I'm still just a fan of TNG Picard. Um, although I, I also feel like I can relate to Spock a lot. So I, I've watched a lot of Star Trek. I watched a lot of Star Trek when I was when I was in school. <laughs> anyway, thank you. <laughs> well, that's all our questions for tonight. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. And it's, it's been wonderful having you on. So thank you once again, Dr. Alkern. Uh, we could certainly stay here chatting for quite a while about science fiction and science. Um, just in case anybody was wondering, uh, hplovecraft.com does currently have all the texts from all the books on their website for free. Um, so uh, if you want to follow any of the reading recommendations, they're, they're definitely there. And one of the fun things I always like to tell people when you're picturing, as Dr. Alcarn said, the, uh, the size of the earth even, if you get a chance to watch the moon rise and actually go out and sit and watch it um, until the moon physically changes for your view, all you have to do is then realize um, you know, these things, you know, if you can then picture, okay, well, is it really just the moon moving or is it from earth spinning? And you can do the same thing with the sunset, but of course you need solar glasses. And with the sun, you can actually get like the full um, earth movement uh, illusion, shall we say. But it's been wonderful having you on and a really great adventure. So thank you once again for tonight. And with that, let's go ahead and hand over to our president of the Toronto Centre, RASC, Tom Luton, to finish off the evening. Thanks, Elena. Good evening, everyone, on this damp night. Um, by the way, if we need to talk anything more about craziness about astronomers, remember, uh, you folks made me president, and I was crazy enough to accept. So let's get on with the announcements. So as Elena was talking about earlier, we've got two types of meetings. Uh, this was one of our speakers' nights. and We also have, in two weeks, our next uh, recreational astronomy night. Uh, for those of you who've been joining us live, uh, say next time uh, please say hello in the chat uh, enter some questions for our presenters if you're a new member introduce yourself and if you're coming from far far away please let us know where you are from so our next recreational astronomy night like i said is in two weeks on the 6th at 7 30 p.m here on youtube andy beaton will be discussing the sky this month I will be conducting a talk on an introduction to asteroid occultations and mavis rubira will be talking about my first star party up north uh, if you'd like to present, please give us, please give, uh, drop a line to Paul Markov. Our next uh, speaker's night is October 20th with Dr. Keith Hawkins. The details of the talk are still uh, a little bit up in the air, so we will have that up on the, up on the website as soon as possible. Uh, over at the, at the David Dunham Observatory on Friday, the 24th of September uh, at 8.30 p.m., uh, we have uh, Up in the Sky, the uh, astro uh, Astronomy Night at the DDO, uh, $12.50 fee. You can register online. The links can be found on our website. Now, this is where I'm plugging our observing certificates. We've had a lot of time at home. Uh, over the last few months. Hopefully some of you have been able to put that to good use. And so if you've completed a certificate, please fill out the paperwork so that we can get you uh, your certificate and one of these nice pins. If you haven't filled out a, uh, done a certificate, we've got several to choose from. 
We've got our Explore the Universe certificate. We have Explore the Moon through binoculars or telescopes. We've got the Messier catalog. We have the finest new general catalog objects. We've got a double star certificate. We have the Isabel Williamson lunar certificate, Deep Sky Gems, and our Deep Sky Challenge. Full details at the link provided. Our educational public outreach activities are ongoing. We've just recently had uh, a virtual star party with the David Dunlop, uh, or sorry, with the uh, Dunlop Institute down at uh, U of T. Uh, we've also got stuff in the works for the science, have or had uh, stuff going on with the Science Center, Millennium Square, the DDO, the St. Clair O'Connor community, the Brownies, Cubs, Scouts, and school groups, and as well with our new observers of visual astronomy. If you'd like more information, please contact public education at rasco.ca. Again, due to the pandemic, uh, all of our uh, club observing sessions at Bayview Village Park, at Long Sioux Conservation Area, and Ontario Science Center are suspended until further notice. The Carr Astronomical Observatory is open on a limited basis. Um, start, it started back in July. Um, for full details, please visit the website. We are accepting online reservations from campers, day users, and modal and locker leaseholders, but we are not accepting reservations to stay in the house. Uh, the slow and the GBO are, uh, sl sorry, the slow is open, the GBO is closed. Uh, full details on the website, and please read all the documentation before you make your bookings. Uh, the Rastrano Center runs on volunteer help, and we need some help. We've got a job board here, and we're looking for some roles to fill. Our observing committee's chair and committee members, uh, light pollution committee chair, national council representative, a marketing committee chair and committee members, the AV committee, who has been putting on such a wonderful uh, presentation uh, behind the scenes tonight, is in need of some extra help. Our education and public outreach committee is in need of additional help, especially telescope camera operators for our virtual star parties in these times. If you're available, please contact the volunteer coordination team, volunteer at raskto.ca. Uh, this is where I plug the benefits of RASC membership. Um, please uh, renew online at secure.rask.ca. Uh, if the coronavirus has thrown things for a loop, uh, we do have a RASC emergency fund. It is completely confidential. Uh, as well, we do offer gift memberships. Uh, to discuss either of those issues, please contact Adela at the national office at mempub at rask.ca. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a very good night. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you can follow us on all the various social media sites. Uh, if you like what you've seen, please like and subscribe and click the notification bell. Uh, once again, be safe. Keep looking up. Have a good night.